Have you ever had expectations of anything? Maybe you thought Star Wars Episode 7 was gonna be more than a glorified New Hope remake. Maybe you thought Fume Knight was gonna make my top 10 hardest bosses in the Soul Series list. Gotcha, bitch! Or maybe you thought Ashes of Ariandel was gonna have more than three hours of painfully average content. That's the wrong number! Oh! Jokes aside, expectations are a hell of a drug in any situation. When specifically related to media, it can color your opinion on a game, movie, etc. before you even get your hands on it. Take the case of Ashes of Ariandel. We all knew the caliber of previous FromSoft DLCs in the Soul Series. It's often some of their best work. So now Naturally, I'm sure nearly every single one of you, myself included, that planned on playing it had some kind of expectation of its quality based on reputation before you even played it. This gave many of us a pre-existing opinion that at the very least it would be good, if not amazing. This means out of the gate, you held it to a higher standard. Without this expectation, maybe the fact that there's only two bosses and a limited amount of content for your $15 wouldn't have been met with potential disappointment. I feel that expectations are toxic to your perspective because things can only go one of three ways. It either meets them, it exceeds them or it fails to meet them and this process begins before you even touch the final product. But what if new media got a clean slate and no comparison to similar titles was offered? This is the question I find myself asking with Neo, or as more commonly I heard it referred to up to release as Samurai Souls. All the build-up and discussion of the danger of the hype train in the introduction was leading to the point of view I'll be using in this review, that of someone who played Neo expecting it to be a Souls clone. My expectation based on everything I heard going in was that it would be similar to Lords of the Fallen. It would attempt to adopt the Souls formula with a bit of its own flavor. Except this time it was actually gonna be good. Being a subjective review from my viewpoint, I have to look at it from my perspective, and I think the additional value this will provide is that many of you on the fence about the game, or maybe even who bought the game, already went in with similar feelings to me. I want to disclaim two things before we get into it. Number one, I didn't play the alpha, beta, or any of the demos prior. I only watched the PSX story trailer for my 2017 anticipated games video, so my experience was about as blind as possible. Number two, I did not finish the game for reasons I'll explain at the end of the video. I played for about 13 hours and I completed 8 out of the 20 main missions, so about 40% of the game. Despite this, I feel my time with the game is more than enough to accurately assess the quality and structure of its design. With that said, let's jump in with just how I think Neo stacks up compared to souls and on its own merit. Before we talk about anything else, I want to clear up something. Fundamentally, from a macro level, the way that Neo is designed bears similarities to Souls, but whereas a game like Bloodborne directly takes the blueprint from Souls and makes minor changes such as lamps instead of bonfires, blood vials instead of Estus, and added the regain mechanic, Neo takes the blueprint used by Souls, erases the majority of the map on the inside, and leaves only a shell on the board. Then it fills in the gaping holes with its own methodology. Before you even say it, I know this is rich coming from the guy who made the whole Demon Dark Blood 3 meme, but while I consider Bloodborne part of the Souls series, I'm not ignorant to the point of not recognizing the mechanical differences it has in comparison to Dark Souls. However, when you take a look between Dark Souls and Bloodborne, they aren't radically different and share a majority of their composition. In the case of Neo, while a lot of surface aspects are shared, there are many differences that make them a surprisingly different experience. The start of Souls always has you picking a class and making a character that you plan on building around. In this game, it's handled a little bit differently. For starters, you're a static character known as William, and this game doesn't even have classes. We'll get to that later, but let's focus on what the game does offer you. Once given the opportunity, you're able to choose between three things, two weapon types to start with, and your spirit animal. Much like Souls, these choices aren't terribly relevant as you'll have the ability to use whatever weapon you like throughout the game, and you'll get a boatload of different spirits to choose from. I'll be explaining what weapons and spirits are shortly, because first I want to talk about where this game harshly deviates from Souls. Leveling in this game matters. A lot. Every mission you partake in has a recommended level, and let me tell you, if you aren't appropriately leveled and geared for the area, the difference is extremely noticeable. My final mission played was recommended level. 55. I went in as a level 41 and was doing roughly 100 less damage per attack than a friend who went into this mission properly leveled. Sure, in Souls, levels do add additional attack, HP, endurance, etc., but if you're good enough, you can easily carry yourself through. In this game, you'll reach a point where you'll need to hit even basic enemies like 20 times and they have the potential to one-shot you. So of course, if you can effectively not get hit and be a master of the game, then you're gonna be fine. But that is quite a tall order to expect of a new player, especially when the combat has a pretty 
large difference to souls. This means to level properly, your Amarita, the equivalent of souls in this game, is absolutely vital. If you lose it as you would a bloodstain, tough shit, you better go farm more if you don't want to be underleveled for the next mission. It should be mentioned too that I played three side missions prior to that eighth mission I was 14 levels under for, and that still wasn't enough. So if you want to make the game not even more brutally difficult than it already is, grinding at times is a near must. This is admittedly something that I'm not a fan of. I've never liked grinding in games if it doesn't feel rewarding, and endlessly killing enemies to farm levels so I can continue isn't my idea of fun. Once you do obtain the necessary Amarita, you might find the leveling system looks similar to Souls, but again, there's key differences. Stats to level don't always give equal value. For example, there were times where I'd level the body stat, which is what my primary weapon leveled with, and it gave some points, and then the next level it didn't give points, and it continued in such a random pattern. I'm honestly not 100% sure how it all works, it seems like the leveling system is kind of random, but I'm gonna admit that this is something I never fully got a grasp on. Which brings me to my next complaint. For as well as the tutorial teaches you the combat, the game's many different forms of character building are left in the shadows for you to discover for yourself. There's basic leveling with Amarita, prestige points awarded for completing challenges that give you passive buffs similar to Bloodborne 2's badass points if you're familiar with that system, ninja points which can be allocated to new abilities and combos for your arsenal, boons, items to buff you, items to buff your weapon, mushroom men to give you passive buffs for each level, and that's not even taking into account the gear scales in this game in a Diablo style loot system with varying rarity, special effects, damage output, and protection. The first time I played Demon Souls, I thought the character building was confusing with little explanation, and it was, but this system goes similarly unexplained and has five times the complications. It's enough to make your head spin. Which brings me to the point of this section. Character building is the evidence of a shift in the genre scale between Neo and Souls. I would consider both games to be action RPG. However, Souls is very light on the RPG aspects, only really adding in leveling with relatively straightforward weapon scaling, upgrades, and buffs to your character's survivability, and instead chooses to focus heavily on the action and atmosphere. In contrast, Neo is a game that has excellent fast-paced action that chooses to weigh down the experience with an astonishingly cumbersome progression system that makes the game frustrating to play casually. And if that isn't what this game is willing to offer, fair enough. But regrettably, I went in with the expectation that I would be able to focus little on building my character and mostly on enjoying the combat. But instead, I found myself searching through menus 10 times more than I ever had to in Souls. That's a true shame because it's time to discuss Neo's biggest strength. Alright, I'm gonna skip right to my controversial opinion and we're gonna go from there. Neo has a better combat system than any of the Souls games and is a true rival to even Bloodborne, a game that I would argue has one of the best combat systems of all time. This is because Neo takes the fundamentals of the Souls combat system, health, stamina, two foes facing off and balancing the aggression between dodging, blocking, and attacking, and then adds so much more depth to it. The first big change is that there's only five weapon classes to choose from. Number one, swords. This weapon type provides a moderate amount of damage with slightly below average range. Overall, I would call it the jack of all trades master of none weapon class. Number two, dual swords, a type with poor range but absolutely sick damage and combos if you can close the distance. Number three, spears, weapons with above average range and power similar to the sword class, however the speed of attack is slower and the large sweeping movements can create difficulty in small spaces. Number four, battle axes, the strength type weapon of the game that offers massive damage in exchange for heavy key usage and long windups. And finally number five, the coup. Die with chain. What is this? <clears throat> a sickle on the end of a chain that offers the most versatility in the game with incredible ranged attacks, insane combos up close, and powerful damage over time if executed under effective attack windows. The game also adds ranged weapons in the form of bows, rifles, and hand cannons, which are mostly used for picking off weak enemies to start an engagement, or at least getting some nice chip damage. Now obviously having over 5 types of weapons in the game means an extremely poor lack of combat variety in comparison to souls, or so you'd think. Instead of putting the focus on having a plethora of different weapons, many of which are arguably useless anyway since they're carbon copies with different names and or scale. Team Ninja added the Brilliant Stance system. In each battle, you can choose a high, medium, or low stance. The stances can be effectively understood from this perspective. The higher the stance, the more power you put out, but in exchange you use a greater amount of key, the endurance of this game, have less ability to block or dodge, and attacks have longer draw time. So a low stance would have poor damage in comparison to a high stance, but it offers nice flexibility to quickly dodge and get fast hits in with low key consumption, whereas a medium stance holds its center mass, making it great for blocking and attacking with sweeps at moderate speeds. I can't stress enough how awesome this system is. It adds so much complexity to the combat and makes it rewarding as hell when you're able to 
string together a bunch of different stances for epic combos. Another big difference is the key pulse. Kind of similar to the health regain in Bloodborne, if you press a button at the right moment after using your key, you'll regain it in an instant. You can even get an ability early on that allows you to pulse using dodges instead of hitting a button, making combat even more fluid. To add even more ability for your skill to allow for top level play, you can mix a stance change with a key pulse since they use the same button to pull off some insane combos. Putting this all together makes for an immensely deep combat system that culminates in one last reward, the living weapon. Remember the spirits I mentioned earlier? When you've gained a maximum connection with your spirit, you can unleash its power within your weapon, gain a state of invulnerability, and increase benefits based on your spirit type. For example, my spirit added fire damage to my weapon and increased its attack power greatly. This is balanced by having a very limited time of effect, a long recharge period, and you can even take damage to the bar during its use for it to run out even faster. But this ability is undoubtedly clutch and provides a way to stack up effectively in the game's harshest of battles. Wrapping up the things I glazed over, you can actually block with your weapon at the cost of key, meaning no shields are necessary in this game, and you can of course use your key to dodge roll and quick step a la Bloodborne out of harm's way with proper timing. Choosing which to do is a matter of preference and circumstance, which adds another wrinkle to the entire system. One last curiosity you may have is the state of backstabs and parrying in this game. While there is no backstab mechanic, you and your foes do take additional damage if attacks land from behind. As for parrying, if an enemy runs out of key, they enter a stun state where you can knock them down and do a massive slam for loads of damage. Of course, if you use up all your key and are struck, you're susceptible to the same fate. But this brings me to my two complaints of the combat system. The first is that not all enemies are created equal. Some can't be knocked down even with no key, some seem to have at times random levels of key, and often the enemies seem to not play by the same rules as you do, as they can use some attacks or even sprint with no key loss at all. Additionally, many enemies can summon auras that regen their stamina instantly while putting you in a debuff state that requires you to use a key pulse to cleanse yourself, otherwise your key won't regen. Though that is balanced by you being able to simply get rid of the debuff by avoiding the circle altogether. Maybe it's just a personal pet peeve, but in such a complex and punishing combat system, it's disappointing when enemies have what feels like an unfair advantage, but honestly, it's not a big complaint and can be dealt with easily as your game knowledge grows. My final complaint is that you get staggered horribly in this game. In almost any case, a landed hit will stagger you for at least a brief moment. This would be okay if almost all enemies didn't kill you in 1-3 to three hits. This means execution in combat is absolutely essential, so if you like hard games, maybe this is a plus for you, but I do think the player should get perhaps a little bit more leeway. Even with those few complaints though, they are minor, and I am serious when I say I would rate this combat system 10 out of 10 and perhaps one of the best ever made in a game. Setting everything else in this review aside, if you love a game with good combat, you're doing yourself a disservice by missing out on Neo. Bringing ourselves back to the Souls comparison, you'll find that level design is a bit of a mixed bag of inspiration. Here's what the levels do right, shortcuts abound. One of my favorite experiences in the Souls games is making it all the way through a level only to reach a door and realize it's right next to a beginning bonfire in the level branching you back. Oh and I suppose I should mention that real quick, shrines are equivalent to the bonfires in Dark Souls. Not much else to say, they serve essentially the same purpose in Neo. As far as enemy design goes, while some enemies are pesky, they are relatively well balanced and have differing patterns that are exhilarating to dissect and overcome. And at its best, the scenery is often very vibrant and beautiful. Unfortunately, I have more complaints than I do praise. I mentioned shortcuts. Well, let me tell you, they sure as shit are necessary because these levels are massive. They are so damn huge and the time between bosses feels like a slog at times. I'll admit, I've always said the focus of these types of games for me is the bosses, but it's a clear design choice in Neo to make the areas be highlighted just as much, if not more so than the bosses at the end of it all. When a level is a blast to go through, this isn't bad at all, but there's some seriously irritating levels. Take for instance this nightmare that's a mixture of Stone Fang Tunnel from Demon Souls and Harvest Valley from Dark Souls 2. Fuck this place, but I've bitched enough about those places in Souls already, so I'll refrain from digging in here. But suffice it to say, the levels themselves are kind of mixed in terms of fun. Then as I praise the enemy design, I can just as easily put it down. This is because the enemies repeat in every damn level. Each level does feature maybe one or two new enemy designs, but for the most part, you'll be facing the same few generic demon enemies again and again and again. Oh, and just as I casually brushed off my mentioning of Shrine, I should probably talk about this game's form of healing and how much I hate it. It's simple to explain because it's exactly like Bloodborne. The exception is you only get 8 elixirs as they're called, and you can only hold a limited amount of stock in your shrine. So you're quickly gonna run out, and that's if you can even find the damn things because the drop rate seems to be so rare. Mind you that old items can be broken down with a chance of rewarding elixirs, and even if you do run out of stock, the shrine always rewards you a few upon death if you're out of stock, but with how difficult the game is for a new player, you're bound to run out, meaning you're likely gonna be only spawning with 3 or 4 healing items to go through each level. This mixed in with the gargantuan levels only adds to the incredible difficulty. 
My final complaint is that when comparing it to Souls, the world building just doesn't match it in the slightest. Each level is a separate self-contained mission, meaning there's no interconnectivity between the worlds you explore. Considering this is one of the aspects that I appreciate most about those games, it makes me quite sad not to see it in Neo. But for as harsh as I might be, I actually do quite like the levels on the whole, they just don't compare to the design and grandeur set by the Souls series. Finally time to talk about the bosses. Oh yeah, that's my thing, d the boss man. And I'm happy to report that on the whole, I enjoy the bosses I fought in my time with the game. I'd say they certainly fit the caliber of Souls bosses, but I do have one minor annoyance. The bosses in this game are freaking tanky, but there are two caveats. First, you do have living weapon, which can shred if used properly. And second, I was under leveled and poorly geared since I was trying to rush through the game. So I don't want to pass too much judgment here. The only real standout boss that I truly dislike was this centipede piece of shit, mainly because it's boring, but also because it doesn't give a fuck about physics. It'll go through walls, floors, even 180 degrees through its own ass. But to be honest, there's a chance I decide to review the bosses individually at a later date, so I'm gonna leave this section more short. To give a summation, I'd say the bosses I experienced are on par with souls. There's some duds, there's some average bouts, and there's some epic battles. This section is also gonna be relatively short, and that's because I pretty much had no clue what was going on the whole time. I'm gonna avoid spoilers here, but I do have some criticism to offer. First, the game's story practically requires you to have some moderate knowledge of Japanese culture and history. That's problematic for someone who doesn't know it well enough. Second, the presentation is kind of all over the place, with jarring cutscenes that only offer Japanese audio with English subtitles, mission briefings and level descriptions that must be read in order to understand what's going on, and overall, what I felt like sloppy presentation all over the board. At its core, it is a really interesting tale, it just seemed all over the place to me. One thing I will say though is that if you're expecting the dark atmosphere of souls with vague lore, you're not going to be getting it here. The story is in your face from the get-go and doesn't stop going hard, weird, and waifu-tastic. Adding up everything I've talked about in this review brings me to a single conclusion. This game is not a Souls-like, it simply borrows some concepts from Souls and runs to the hill with them in some areas with the phenomenal combat and exciting boss battles, but falters a bit in story presentation, fully competent level design, and a puzzling character progression system. I stand by the idea that Souls games are action RPGs that are heavy on action and light on the RPG, whereas Neo is an action RPG that puts the RPG features at the forefront and the action in the background. Which is a massive shame because the action is the highlight of the game. The combat is stellar and is no better than when you're going toe to toe with an excellent boss. But I'm gonna admit that I have a problem with the way that I view the game's negativities. I say a lot of the things are bad not because they're bad on their own merit, but because they don't compare well to Souls. Take level design for example. Sure lacking enemy variety is a downside of this game on its own, but how can I fault the game for not deciding to have open world interconnectivity? Sure it'd be really nice, but if it was a deliberate design choice by the developers to have it this way, how can I fault it for that? And and in the context of the game, the mission system actually really works well. I have to honestly ask myself if I'd never played a Souls game and I played Neo, would this even bother me? The same can persist for many of the complaints I posited throughout the video. So with my audience largely being a collection of gamers that are diehard Souls fans, I implore you all. If you haven't played this game, it is absolutely worth your time based on the strength of combat alone and still has a breadth of amazing features in its other areas that largely outweigh the negatives. But do your absolute best to view it as its own game. It's not a Souls game and I don't think it's trying to be. I believe it should be viewed as a monstrously deep RPG with marvelous combat that stands on its own merits as a new IP. In this day and age, complete ingenuity in gaming is hard to come by. And while Neo does lean on a few different game design tropes, especially from Souls, it's a fantastic game that is worth a series in its own right. Now the final question is, if I feel this way about the game, why did I stop playing before completing it? Sadly, I just don't have the time to finish it right now. I was expecting to go in and be able to beat the game in roughly 25 to 30 hours since I have a high level of skill in Souls, but with this actually being a deep RPG with a combat system all its own, I found myself struggling to progress without grinding a bit. And frankly, with the other videos I'm trying to deliver for you all and stay on schedule, it would be selfish of me to spend the 70 or so hours I think it'd take to really appreciate the game right now, so I'm going to be shelving it for a later date and leaving you with my first impressions. Maybe I'll return to it later and make a boss ranking and an updated review down the line. But with the last compliment of 70 hours of legitimate content, I'll give one last nod to say if you're a fan of Souls, you're likely to be a fan of Neo. Just realize it's okay to be fans of both entities that stand alone as entirely different different games. I hope you all enjoyed my review of Neo, and if you're playing the game yourself, I wish you all the best in your merciless tour of demon-ridden Japan. As I mentioned, I am working behind the scenes on a lot of new content for the channel right now, and I can't wait to share it all with you very soon. To get updates on those videos, be sure to follow me on Twitter. If you're watching this video as it goes live, I'm going live on Twitch right now, speedrunning Dark Souls 3. The link is at the top of the description. Thank you all for joining me today. Much love, and I'll see you in the next video.